thank you. So let's start quickly. So I would first like to acknowledge that this is joint work with a PhD student, ben Benjamin Walter, who is on the market. So if you are looking for an economist that understands the blockchain, you can contact me. So we are uh, the Crest. So the Crest is a research center in economics and statistics of the Ecole Polytechnique, okay, in Paris. And uh, I've been working on, uh, on this topic for a couple of years. So, you know, all of you know already that um, the mining industry has started to pollute a lot, no? So before, not so long ago, it was a very small activity. Now it accounts for 0.3% of the pollution in the world. So to put things in perspective, it's equivalent to the pollution of uh, Switzerland, electricity consumption of Switzerland. Or another way to put it is one transaction in Bitcoin is as much pollution as a flight uh, from here to New York, all right, every time, every transaction. So that's really a, a huge concern in a, in a time of global warming. I mean, I don't think we can dismiss this so easily, okay? And uh, even if you don't care about the environment, which uh, you should, but even if that's not your problem, you want to understand how the market uh, for mining behaves first because I mean, here I put a graph that you see everywhere on the internet, which shows a, vi a virtual circle around Bitcoin. And at the center of this uh, ecosystem, we have miners. And we don't really fully understand how the market for mining behaves. And so I think until we understand that, we cannot be 100% uh, sure of the security of the system. And this is also, of course, relevant for other cryptocurrency. So our paper, I believe, um, as far as we know, is the first equilibrium model of the evolution of the market for Bitcoin mining. So there are two important words here. First, evolution, it's a dynamic model. And we think it's really important to think dynamic because as I said, five years ago, mining industry was nothing, a few guys mining at home, now it's a huge industry. So you have to take a dynamic perspective. And the second thing, it's an equilibrium model. And this is key because people here talk a lot about incentives and understand that you're not, most of you, or for most of the people here, maybe not here, are not economists. But incentives is not a concept where you are in an environment and you play against something that is fixed. A Nash equilibrium is a best response, so everything has to be an equilibrium concept, no? So you have to guess a policy, then verify that when this policy, the policy that you've guessed is followed by everyone, it's indeed a best response, okay? That's the way you do it strategically. And uh, as far as we know, nobody has done this work for the mining market. So we claim that we do, we, we've done it, and uh, what we get is a model that allows you to predict the hash power of the network by using the Bitcoin uh, US dollar exchange rate, okay? So something like this graph, you now you take the exchange rate, you use our model and you get the hash rate. So now maybe you're gonna be like, okay, this is obvious, I can do it. I mean, maybe it's just a formula, and actually it's not. First, we show that it's not the exchange rate which is the right measure. You have to take into account the rate of technological progress. So first, we build the right measure that you should be used. Then second, we show that the relationship between the exchange rate and the hash rate depends on some deep parameter which encodes the evolution of the exchange rate in future period, and I will explain that later. And finally, actually, the hash rate does not depend on the price today. It depends on what we call the running max. So the running max is the highest price achieved in the past. So if you look at the price today, you want to know the hash rate, you're going to miss it. Okay, and then once we have done that, we're going to show that the model works very well. We are able to predict the hash rate of the, of the market. And so we are able to make some conjecture about what's going to happen. And this, doesn't, and this is not pretty because things are going to get worse according to our model. So the main finding is that minor investment in computing power is a, you can forecast it on the basis of the Bitcoin dollar exchange rate. The market behave as a standard uh, competitive industry with partial irreversible reversible investment. So these are called SS model. Maybe you know them. I will explain later on what they are. And uh, also one thing is that people often say that if to, to know what happened to the hash rate, you should look at the electricity cost, and we show this is completely irrelevant. Okay? This is a complete misunderstanding. Electricity costs are totally secondary. Okay, so usually when I present this, model, I explain how Bitcoin works. I'm not going to do it here, obviously. I'm going to jump directly into the model because you all know that. Um, 
so let and so yes, okay, sorry. So just to introduce some notation, the probability to find a valid block increase uh, linearly in hash power. No, I mean if you have one machine or two machines, you don't uh, the probability to find a block increase by two. Okay, if you multiply the number of machines by two, there is not increasing. There is no increasing return to scale. So we can normalize and look at the problem of each miner separately as one unit. So then R is going to be used for reward. So it's just a new coin per block plus the fees times the exchange rate at the time the block is issued. So now you, you may ask me why at that time. So I've contacted miners. So what they told me is that they indeed exchange very quickly their reward. And why do they do that? It's pretty obvious because their, their, mining, their mining hardware has no value outside of Bitcoin. So they need to edge their position. So they edge by not keeping Bitcoin because already the value of the hardware is in Bitcoin. So it's logical that they transfer their reward as quick as they can. So what is the expected payoff of a miner? It's R if he wins and times P, P, uh, P which is the probability that he wins. So P is the probability in each period that if you have one unit of hash power, you're going to find a block, okay? And this is going to be endogenous, obviously. So now I'm going to introduce a set of assumptions for the model. So some are very realistic, some are less realistic, but the less realistic ones, I'm going to relax them later. So first, um, we assume that the valid proof of work is continuously updated. So you know that every 2016 blocks, Bitcoin updates the difficulty. So uh, basically every two weeks, we're going to assume it's done at every instant. It's not very important for the model because actually Bitcoin is able to match the statistic pretty well. So then we assume that mining units cannot be switched off. So that's a strong assumption. Okay, so you, once you buy a mining unit, mining ring, you run it and you cannot switch it off, okay? So of course we relax it later on in the paper, but it's very hard to analyze the model with that and it doesn't change much quantitatively. So this is the assumption I will keep for now. Then revenues, so revenues are basically the exchange rate. We assume that the exchange rate follows the geometric Brownian motion. So for those of you who know their finance stuff, this is a standard assumption for asset prices. So basically if you take the log of our of the revenue, it's equal to the log of the revenue last period plus a trend plus some noise which is normally distributed, okay? Log normally distributed variable. So, um, geometric Boolean motion is the continuous time limit of that. Okay, that's just a technical point. So it's a common thing to do in finance and that's how people model asset prices in the old finance textbook. We check that it works for Bitcoin and it worked more or less. Not perfectly, but it worked more or less because Bitcoin has a period of trading frenzy where the volatility is very high for a few weeks. And this is not really in the model, but it will be very hard to add. And finally, we assume that much, mm, the mining rigs, so the machines get more efficient over time, no? so that you can mine with the same amount of dollar you buy a machine, and if you buy it uh, today, it's much more efficient than the, y, the one that you bought, let's say, last year. And we have data on that, and I'm going to show you that it's true. So now the problem of a miner essentially can look like that. You have the value. So here, okay, I don't have a pointer, but you have the value at time t, and tau is the time when you enter. So tau is smaller than t, so let's say you enter at that zero, and now you're at that one, t is one, and tau is zero. What is the value? It's the expectation of your future payoff, which are the reward times the probability that you find the block, minus c, which is the cost of the electricity, no? cost to operate the machine. And notice that C is indexed by tau because the electricity cost is linked to the edge of the machine. So here we have made the assumption that electricity costs are constant. They don't vary over time, okay? There is no randomness in electricity cost. But it's so small, the randomness, that it doesn't matter. So when you enter, you pay. So when you enter, so it's really annoying not to have a pointer, but you see this minus I, it's the investment. So you enter, you pay the investment, and as time goes on, you, you make profit. Okay, so that's basically the problem. And we think that there is free entry in the mining market because everybody can enter, no? I mean, okay, now it's a bit more complicated. They have mining farms, but for a long time, all you had to do, and I don't know why I did not do it, but I, <laughs> that's too bad, but all you had to do is to buy the machine or even use a GPU and upload the software and run it. So it's really free entry, no? That's what we call free entry. And so free entry holds when you enter at time t, that's a payoff at time t, that's your forward-looking value, it cannot be higher than the cost of investment because otherwise you will make profit and there will be opportunity, okay? And this, in economics, we believe that there is no profit opportunities that are left unused. 
So we assume free entry, so this is, and so this is gonna be true all the time, but when you have equality, that's when you enter. All right? When, it's, when you have the inequality, it means the value is smaller than the cost of, of buying the machine, I, and when you have equality, the value of the machine is exactly equal to the cost. But it can never be in the other direction. It can never be superior, because then there will be a uh, profit opportunity which is inconsistent with free entry. So now the flow payoff, if you remember, is the revenues times the probability to find a block, but since Bitcoin update all the time the probability to find the block, Q is the hash power, and so the probability to find the block is one divided by Q. So when there is more hash power, you have less chance to find the block. It's becoming more, more and more hash power makes it more and more difficult to find the block. Is it? I don't know. Okay? So this generates an increasing cost function because if you have more people entering the market, it's more costly, and you can conjecture that the equilibrium will look like that. So this is very well known in economics, it's known since the 90s, and that's the standard model of investment, of industry dynamics. You will have what we call a reflecting barrier. So remember, P is our measure of expected payoff. So what's gonna happen, it's gonna move, but at some point it will hit an upper bound, P upper bar, and when it hit P upper bar, people will enter. So all I'm saying is that the miners, they look at the market, they have a measure of payoff, and when they see it hitting a bar, some level, they enter. Now, what happens when they enter? The hash power goes up, all right? So the success rate goes down because Bitcoin updates the difficulty, and so P, which is R times P, goes down. So it looks like this. The red line, here above, we have the payoff measure, so P, and the red line is the barrier, which is gonna be endogenously determined by the model, all right? So the payoff fluctuates freely because it's a brand, it's a, Brownian motion, geometric Brownian motion. However, when it hits the barrier, you see the red barrier, it rebounds because people are entering and the hash rate goes up and remember that P is R divided by Q. So when Q goes up, P goes down, okay? So entry brings the, the, barri the payoff to the barrier. And if you see, every time you hit the barrier, if you look at the line below, this is the hash rate, the hash rate goes up because you have entry. Is that clear? That's, so we, we conjecture it's, a, it's the structure of the equilibria. So to repeat, the payoff measure that I've explained to you is gonna to belong to a closed compact interval, zero P upper bar. Free entry is gonna be satisfied at all points. So meaning that there will be no entry between zero and P upper bar, and people will enter when P equals P upper bar. So, and then the network hash power will increase exactly at that point. Okay, so we conjecture, we think that Bitcoin looks like that, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna test it, no? I'm gonna bring that model to the data, and I'm gonna show you that it works, okay? That's, how, that's what we're gonna do. And also, yes, one last thing, the barrier, if you notice, is not flat, the red, okay? Why? Because there is technological progress. Because machines are better and better and better all the time. So we prove, so one part of our paper is that we prove that the barrier exists and it decreases at the rate of technological progress. Okay, so now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna convince you that the model works. I'm gonna test it on the data, and once I have tested it, then I'm gonna use it to try to predict the future of the mining industry. So first, I need to convince you. So the reward is just new coin plus fees, time exchange rate, this you observe. It's, in, you just, it's, in the, it's just publicly available, no? On, uh, you go to any uh, trading platform, you have it. So the hash power you don't really observe, no? I mean, you just observe the number of blocks that are found at each uh, over a certain amount of time. But you can infer it as Bitcoin does to update the difficulty of the puzzle. So we infer the, hash, we infer the difficulty. So this is how it looks from the data. On the left, you have the logarithm of the block reward, so something you find on uh, any trading platform. And then on the right, you have the network hash rate that you can infer from the rate at which blocks have been found, okay? And then you take the ratio of the two. So that was my first point. I say we have a model, you, and you have an input, and you can predict the hash rate. But you cannot use just the block reward. You have to divide the two, okay? So that's the real measure that should be used to, to forecast um, the hash rate of the network. And you have to detrend by the rate of technological progress which is, you can observe how the machine uh, accelerates. So when you do that, you have this figure. Now this figure, you remember it should rebound. It doesn't look like it rebounded because there is a period where it drops like that. But this period, if you look at the data, is precisely when ASICs were introduced. So I don't know if you are aware of that, if you're familiar, but at some point in 2013, 
people, bef before people were using graphic processing unit, but at some point, Bit, um, Bitman created a machine that were only doing uh, Bitcoin mining. And so the rate of technological progress accelerated, and this is this intermediate period where the model should not work. But the two other periods, the rate of technological progress is more or less constant, which fits our model. And here we should observe something like a reflected Brownian motion. So what we do is that we're going to focus on the red sub-period and on the green, excluding the transition period, and then we're going to calibrate the barrier and see if we can fit the data. So, I don't, know, I don't know how fast I was. 20 minutes, okay. So, the way we do, so what we do is a basic calibration. Basically, we simulate the model, and then we minimize the distance between the model and uh, the data. So, and, that, and we use that to calibrate the rate of technological progress, big A, put small A, and the barrier, big P upper bar. Okay, you minimize the distance and you get something. So, first let me give you the result of the calibration and then I will show you that it works very well. So, first you have the um, mu is the growth rate of the price of Bitcoin and sigma square is the variance of Bitcoin. So this is you get directly from the data, all right? You look at the data and you directly estimate it. So, Bitcoin has a huge variance. That's well known, it's just completely uh, ten, uh, 10 times more va uh, variance than any asset. And the calibrated is the rate of technological progress. So this is also huge. So meaning that the machine and the mining technology accelerated very fast. So Moore's law is 0 0.36, I think, right? Or 20, yes, I think Moore's law is 0 0.36. So this is, even in the second period, we are two times faster than Moore's law. So I don't know, the miners, they were able to have a lot of innovation specific to mining, and they were mining at a faster and faster rate. But the machines were getting better and better. And this is the cost of one unit of tera ash per second. So the beginning of the first period, so we are in 2011, it costed uh, $5 million to buy one unit of tera ash per second. At the beginning of the second period, which is, sorry, I don't remember the date, 2015, uh, October 2015, you see, then it costed 1,800 euro, dollar, sorry. So that shows you the speed of the technological progress. You have it just in the cost. Okay, so now, okay, I spare you the suspense. So how the model works, okay, this is what we think is a really great fit. So remember, we're not trying to fit short-term fluctuation, we just want the mid medium run. So the log of Q is the data, so that's the hash rate, that's what we want to explain. And log, the blue line, is what we get from the model. Okay, so you have to understand that when we do the simulation, we have calibrated the model, then we start, we run, we just put the price that we observe in the data and we let it run. So if there was a problem, the stuff will diverge. Okay, we have two parameters and we have 700 points. So we start with the two parameters and then we let just the price that we observe in the data run and that's what we get. So the model is really following. So it looks like the miners are doing something very close to what the model predicts. Okay, so that's in the first and in the second period. So another way to look at it is that you can inspect the rule, no? So I told you there is a barrier, a reflecting barrier, so do we observe reflection at the barrier? Okay, so here is the data, and so the data is in green, and the model is in blue. So forget about the first one, which is not so convincing. So look at the second one, it's okay. The first one is okay, except at the beginning. At the beginning, you see, but this is, I mean, you have to realize that this is amazing because when we calibrate the model, we did not target that. Huh? We just target the outcome. We did not make sure that it, was, it would look like a reflecting barrier. And it turns out it looks like a reflecting barrier. So now, at the beginning, you see it doesn't really work. So what's happening there? Look, below you have the price, the exchange rate. So in 2011, there was a boom in the exchange rate of Bitcoin. So what happened, here the model does not work, but it's obvious why it doesn't work. Imagine that Bitcoin increased by 40% in a day. And this is exactly what, here it's even more, I don't know, it's like 100% in a day. Now, the model would predict that on the same day, the number of miners will maybe increase by 50 or 100%. This is obviously impossible, no? There is some delay. So when you have huge price change, the model fails. Because when you have huge price change, you will need huge adjustment. But when you have small adjustment to which people can respond, the model works pretty well, okay? So this explains why we have some discrepancy, but over time they are compensated and the model still performs. So it's a model on medium to long run evolution. 
in a very, very short run, sometimes people like in the bubble in 2018, suddenly, okay, so I think before the bubble, so you correct me, uh, Benjamin, there was 300,000 machines, and then at the top of the bubble, you needed 2 million machines. So in six months, they would have need to buy 2 million machines from the producer. You understand it's impossible. The producer could not produce 2 million machines in, in six months, no? So then you, you have a constraint. But when you don't have that, the model works. So then we did out of sample tests. So, I don't, so to tell you is instead of calibrating the model on the whole period, we calibrate it just at the beginning. So we don't use all the information and we test it. And it works also pretty well. So that's a strong test. We don't use all the information. We said just use six months and run the model. So this shows that you can use it for forecasting. Because this is what you will do if you were to forecast. All right? No. Yes, so when you calibrate, you take the red line and you try to make the blue line as close as possible to the red line, okay? But you have only two parameters. But for forecasting, the... the so forecasting, once you have your two parameters, then you, then you need to do some forecast on the exchange rate. So you can do some uh, confidence interval, uh, value at risk, stuff like that. Of course, you cannot have one point. Yeah. But, okay, so I don't know, how long do I have? Okay, a lot of time. So in the model, there is a few things we did not take into account. We didn't take into account halvings. So I don't know if you, uh, probably you know, every four years, the reward per block is divided by two. So it's more hard because then you have to use numerical methods. So we use finite difference method. And the barrier looks like this. So this is, you see the barrier with halving, it goes up just before the halving. So this is something that has puzzled practitioners because they say, okay, you have this huge halving, the money reward is divided by two and you don't see much happening in the market. No, I mean, you divide by two and you look at the data and nothing is happening. So how is that possible? And our model tells you it's actually what, it's not surprising because look, the barrier only increased maybe, what, three months before? So three months before it has no effect and only one or two months before it has an effect. How is that possible? The answer is twofold. First, the machine, the technological progress of machine is very fast. There is a lot of uncertainty in the price of Bitcoin. So losing 50% when you look five months before and you, have a, and you are mining, it's quite possible. So what I'm saying is that in normal time, a loss of 50% is not so incredible. So they only start to notice it and make and change and procrastinate more before entering when they are very close to the barrier. So you will have an effect only a few months before. Now, if the price of Bitcoin stabilizes, which is happening right now, the barrier will be more noticeable. Maybe six months or one year before we will see a drop in investment. Okay, so that's the model. So now we recalibrate the model. It's more complicated because we use numerical method. But look, the blue, so the green one was without halving and the blue one is with halving. And it works better, no? You see around the halving date, so then it's underestimated before, but I think we can agree that it's at least we don't have an overshoot at the halving date. The previous model was overshooting because it could not predict halving. So when you had halving, you imp improve the performance. And the last thing is, can you switch off your machine? So I'm gonna spare you. So if you switch off your machine, what you have is that you don't have always the payoff. You have to compare the payoff to the cost. And when the cost, electricity costs are higher than the payoff, you can switch off. And when the, electric, the price goes up, you switch on again, no? So some miners do that, no? Actually, I talk to people in Canada, they switch on in the morning and they switch, uh, they do it during the day, no? When pe so basically, they work during the night and when people wake up and start to use electricity, when the price goes up, they switch off and then they switch on. Okay, so that's what they do. So here, you can put it in the model. So it's called move balling because you move ball the hardware, that's the way we say it. Uh, now it's kind of complicated. So what you will get is something like this. You will still get a barrier. It will rebound. When the price goes below the electricity cost, the blue line, you move ball. So here you say, okay, I wait because the price is too low. Electricity is too expensive. And then there is a period, big T, where you're going to scrap the machine because there has been so much technological progress that your machine is so old that you can just get rid of it. It costs, it's not competitive anymore. Okay? So this is kind of hard to, 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 to simulate. But the point is that it does not change much. Because actually in practice, the price of Bitcoin was going up so much that very few machines were actually mothball, okay, for a long period. And uh, when we run the model, I mean, I, don't, I didn't put the slide, but it, does, it doesn't change. 
the prediction. It's hardly better. It's much harder to run that model, but it doesn't give you much better prediction. Okay. The only thing that it does better, I don't know, okay, I, I, maybe I should have the slide. If you look here, you see that line here, log of Q, the first period, you see at some point it goes down during this winter, this crypto winter, no? uh, when the uh, price were not going up. You see that the hash power went down. Of course, our basic model cannot do that, no? Because it's irreversible. You can never go down. If with the extended model I show you, you can get that. But that's the only period where it matters. I should have put the... I forgot to put the graph. So my bottom line, it's more complicated, it's more realistic, better micro foundation, but it doesn't really help to fit the data because you already fit the data pretty well. So now let me conclude. Uh, no, so let me just show. But what it does, it allows you to distinguish between the electricity cost and the entry cost. So this is a calibration with exit, so forget about the baseline, which was the first model. What you see, it decomposes the price of so you enter, so that K0 is the total cost over the lifetime of a machine. So what you see first is that the machine lasts on average 2.6 years. So they buy a machine after 2.6 years on average, they, they throw it away. And we talk to miners and they agree. So by the way, we talk to guys to say, okay, is it correct? And the number are okay. So what the model gets is exactly what the miner tells you. Not exactly because everyone has different experience, but it's really in the ballpark. So they tell us after 2.5 years, we throw away the machine. Now the overall cost for a machine is like $1,500. Uh, $1, and if you decompose it, so C0 is, no, I0 is the price of the mining ring, so it's $1,000. So basically two thirds of the cost are spent on the machine. And this is important because when you hear people talking about Bitcoin, they always talk about seniorage income, you know, like the fact that you get money from printing, minting new coin, and they say it's spent in electricity. It's not true. Actually, it's not spent in electricity, it's spent, most of it, two-thirds of it is spent in mining hardware. Which means that someone is making a lot of money, but not the electricity producer, the guy who produce, produces this machine. And you know who, who that company is? Bitman, no? So Bitman last year made four billion profit which is more than NVIDIA, okay? The guy that does these mining rigs, which are very big, made more profit than NVIDIA. I mean, let's let that sink in, and it's just unbelievable. It's not a publicly. So now they are facing competition. Samsung is entering the market because they understood that there is a lot of money to be done. So now the question is, uh, what's going to happen? And uh, what's going to happen is that the price of the mining rig is going to go down because there will be more competition. People now understand, okay, let's go in. So this is going to increase the electricity cost. So this is good for, this is not good. The electricity, uh, electricity consumption is going to go up because the miner will spend less money on the mining hardware, so they will be able to spend more on electricity. So they will enter more and spend more electricity. Second thing that is going to happen, technological progress is going to go down because it cannot be that fast. We will converge to Moore's law at best. And if you have less technological progress, you have more pollution. Not because machines are worse. This is not an economic thinking. This is wrong. It's not because machines are worse when you have less technological progress. Because the reason is completely different. The reason is that when you have less technological progress, okay, you face less competition, so you can, your machine lasts longer, so it's more profitable to enter. And this will increase also electricity consumption, yes. So, my understanding is that like, no individual miners now, they always organize themselves to do transportation. And then reduce the... Reduce the... Reduce competition. They are like, in, in last year, all these individual miners are who will lose the mining with these... So first, a pool is not one person. You can join a pool. You can be part of the pool. I can be part of the pool. So pool. Now let me finish. Okay, I understand your question. So a pool is not one person. So that's completely, and people are actually very worried that free pool are 50%. I think it's stupid because if I'm joined uh, Ant, uh, Ant, um, it's Ant Mining, or I forgot the name, Ant Pool, thank you. If I join and I see that they are doing crazy stuff and breaking Bitcoin, I leave. They don't control me, okay? They are not like one entity. The second thing, even if you have 15, it's enough to have competition. I mean, actually, we, we know that oligopolistic behavior above three or four, they don't really arise. So. Yes, but yes, they cannot. But uh, they can only compete on uh, more hash power. And now, in the end, I can say the proof is in the cake. I mean, we made this assumption, the model works. I mean, then, 
I understand that maybe we want to look more in the microstructure. Now the problem is that if you want to look at the exact structure of the industry, I talk to miners, it's very hard to get proper information. Nobody really knows what's going on there with real data, no? To really look at what the mining farm, where they are, what they do. They don't tell you, I mean, they tell you. We are lucky to talk to one guy who was, but most of them are very secretive, no? So I think it's very hard to see if they have oligopolistic behavior, maybe. But, yeah. I think it's also hard because it's, the, the beauty of Bitcoin, I think it's that it's just this competition, no? Everybody has to run the same game. You cannot really rig it, no? You have to hash. It's essentially the same problem. So anyway, so let me finish. So what's the point of what we've done? So first, me, if I'm an economist, so I see a lot of people talking about incentives, which is nice that people understand now that we need incentive to devise an ecosystem, and then suddenly computer science thinks that incentive and people and humans should enter the system. But then you have to do it properly, and you have to do incentive in equilibrium. It's not enough to just say incentive. You have to just model them, as we do in game theory, as an equilibrium object. Okay, this is really key. Okay, so the point, what can be done with the model? So we have already been contacted by some people. You can use it to forecast. Because if you invest in mining, it's not enough to know the Bitcoin price. You want to know your competitor. You want to know the hash power because your profit has, 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 is a ratio of the price to the hash rate. So you need to forecast the hash rate. And we believe our model actually is the only one that can do that. We are not aware of any model out there that can forecast the hash rate. But, so, okay, that's... For my practitioner, it's important. Now, for the future of Bitcoin, going back to the introduction, one good message for Bitcoin practitioner is that if the price drop, you saw that they don't go out of the market because it's irreversible. So the hash power don't drop, which is great for uh, the security of the network. No? The price fall, the hash power stay where it is. So the security is ensured. It's pretty bad for the environment, but it's good for the, So that's a good message for the security. Now, change in electricity cost for the moment, forget about it. What matters are the change in Bitcoin price. Okay, this is what matters. Seniorage, I don't know if you care about that, but okay, I work also for central bank. If you talk to central banks, that's their business. The whole point of issuing notes is to make seniorage income. Everybody says it's capture in electricity. It's not true. It's the people who sell the material that have got most of it. And now, the worst part is that the price volatility will go down. It will, this will lower the barrier. The rate of technological progress will go down, which will improve the return on investment because the machine become obsolete at a slower rate. And so, there will be more electricity consumption. So what we find is that, forget, so of course, if the price of Bitcoin goes up, there will be more electricity consumption. This, you don't need our model to understand that. But what we are saying is that even if the price stays constant, there will be more electricity consumption. So according to our, to our computation, if you take the overall block reward, 40%, 38, we find, was spent on electricity over the last two years. We expect in the next two or three years that 50 to 60% of the total reward will be spent on electricity. So what I'm saying is that if the price of Bitcoin stays constant, okay, then the electricity consumption will increase by 20 or 30%. Now, maybe you don't think it's a big deal. I think it's a huge deal because if you make some back of the envelope comp computation, if Bitcoin is worth $40,000, okay, by the next halving, so in two years, so it's not such a huge return for Bitcoin. I mean, we are, now I don't know where we are today, but let's say 10,000, 40, like times four in two years. With the halving and so on, we will consume like 1% of the world electricity if Bitcoin is worth. So I, I think at some point there is a cap. I mean, Bitcoin is not going to consume 5% of the world electricity. This is never going to happen. It's going to be regulated well before that. So right now, I think we're still okay. It's, it's likely to get worse in terms of uh, consumption energy. And um, I think uh, it puts a cap on the price of Bitcoin. People have to understand that. It cannot go to 200,000. This is important because 200,000 will mean 5, 10% of all electricity. It's just impossible. We, there will be a backlash. So I think the next step when you get there is to see what we can do as a community to lower Bitcoin consumption in electricity. I think it's something that has to be put on the agenda before the regulator do it for us and kill Bitcoin. Yeah, sorry for the <laughs> gloomy. I didn't want to break the mood, but uh, yeah. Thank you very much.
much. Thank you. Do we have questions in the audience? Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, differences for the people is also the facility and the building. Uh, yeah, so that's also a big part of the, the cost as well. Even though it's more like a, to some extent, it's more like a big stuff, but I think if you have so, okay, two things. So first, look, we don't really look at the, uh, most of the data we use are previous period, no? Mm -hmm. So this was less true two years ago, no? Yeah. This huge mining farm. Now, second thing, the cooling, a lot of it is electricity. Yeah. A lot of it is, uh, I mean, actually, I talk to these guys, they have like, they make big walls. I don't know if some of you are into mining, but... It's kind of, I don't know if you ever went to a mining farm. I mean, it's scary and cool at the same time, but they have like this huge mining wall, and that makes a lot of, of heat, and the heat moves, and they create some circulation of the air to cool down the machine naturally, and then they have some fun to accelerate it. But like, huge wall, that's what they told me they were doing. Yeah. So, and so the point of, uh, I agree, so all these points are well taken. I mean, it's, our model is probably more a model of back in the day when you could like, you know, by your machine, do we go in a basement and mine coin? Even the ASIC at the beginning, two or three years ago, I mean, we have to realize like two years ago it was not that. I mean, you could like people were buying ASIC online and you could have five of them and mine in your basement, no? It was okay. And the other answer I have to that is that maybe if you don't have a huge mining farm, you don't really need to cool down. Uh, but I don't know, you seem like you are a miner, so okay. <laughs> I, my understanding is that this is a huge issue when you have this big wall and, the, uh, yeah. and you have some externalities. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, one of the big advantages of, uh, of big manor is mostly because they can uh, reduce the cost of uh, uh, like, like uh, hosting one machine, like uh, reduce the average cost for hosting one machine. Like, for example, if you are running at your home, uh, electricity wise is one thing, but if, because your home can only hook up to certain ah, yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. Yeah. where if they have a huge mining farm, like per square feet cost of uh, uh, hosting such a machine is going to be much lower. So I yeah. think it's definitely yeah. economy of scale. And they're also close yeah. to electricity. They put yeah. themselves very cheap to electricity sources. Yeah. No, I agree. No, but I think the next step is to take the industrial structure and look into like this big mining farm, how they behave. Now the point is, I think we don't have data on that and we'll take years before anyone can look at it scientifically because right now it's only conjecture. It's, yeah. like, it's a wild west, nobody really knows who is doing what, no? But uh, I agree, I think, and it was less relevant when we, at the period when we look, but now I think it's becoming more and more relevant, which goes back to, you, to your point too. Yeah. Yeah. Further questions? Yes? So, you mean that you kind of put the idea that this mining is very competitive. I would expect that all mining is done in the location with the roads and this. And it seems to be very competitive. So, this works only if this place you're talking about, this cheap electricity we place, has infinite supply of cheap electricity. Maybe, they have, maybe the cheap one is already full, taken, so they have then to, you know? I mean, geographically, I mean, if your reasoning was true, there would be only one town in the world. We would all be in New York. You know, that's the same problem. At some point, you have some congestion. So I think maybe the cheapest has been taken and so on. So what I got from, from people in Canada is that, for example, one problem that you have is that like locals like, get uh, pissed off. <laughs> no, but really, like, at some point, you cannot put too much mining hardware because they start to put farms, and the people, they are like, you know, the electricity cost goes up, and then uh, they go to the tunnel and they say, okay, we don't want another, and so you have to spread. Although it will be profitable to go there, you, you cannot like, take over the, you see, the local network electricity because people are like... Uh... So there is this kind of constraint that... Uh... No, but I agree. I mean, all of this, I agree. I mean, I think this, it's very, it will be much harder to do, no? And you, again... Any further questions? Yeah. No matter? We have a lot of speculation around this one. Yeah? And you say that if people are unable to join the market, join the mining because of electricity consumption, for example, it's too expensive, it means that it will control the coin price. So money speculation won't 
helps to raise prices because I am unable to buy the farm. Is it what you say? Mm. Ah, so the price, you mean the price of Bitcoin? The price of Bitcoin. No, no. So the exchange rate between Bitcoin and the US dollar is totally exogenous to our model. So we are assuming that what the miners do has no feedback effect on the, pri on the price of Bitcoin. We are assuming that. I mean, the model works, but we are assuming that. So my feeling is that it's a one-zero situation. If people believe that the Bitcoin is safe, they don't care about what's going on in the mining market. Maybe one day, if they think there is not enough mining power, then the price of Bitcoin will crumble. I think it's like a crisis type of situation. I don't think that people look at the mining power and update the price. So, we, so for us, it's really price, cause, hash power, and no feedback. Is that clear? That's, that's, yeah, OK. It was not clear, sorry. There are no yeah. more questions. Um, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.